have Professor Stephen Holt. He's Professor of Nephrology in Khalifa University and the CEO of Saha Kidney Center. Welcome in uh, our society and uh, conference, uh, Professor. Thanks. Do you want to pull my slide up? Hi, thank you very much indeed for welcoming me to present at this meeting. I'm very honored. Uh, my name's Steve Holt. I'm uh, Professor Director and CEO of Saha Kidney Care. I want to talk to you today a, a bit of a story about this molecule here, myoglobin. Um, I came across this almost accidentally during my PhD, and I've uh, had the great fortune to uh, been involved in this protein now over the <clears throat> course of a few years. <clears throat> and this, um, the, the stuff I'm going to tell you about today not only applies to myoglobin, but probably hemoglobin as well. So this is a heme protein surrounded by a porphyrin ring, and inside the porphyrin ring, there's an iron molecule. We've known that uh, myoglobin is toxic to the kidneys for some time, but historically... The first description of this probably goes back to the Christian holy book, the Bible, where Israelites ate quail who'd fed on hemlock seeds, and they developed acute renal failure. And that's probably the first description that we have of rhabdomyolysis. There was another outbreak of acute kidney injury in 1924 um, with burbot poisoning which led to acute kidney injury, thought to be related to rhabdomyolysis. But really the first scientific description of rhabdomyolysis was during the Blitz in London in 1941, when Bywaters and Beale looked after patients who'd been crushed by falling buildings. And they neatly described how they developed acute kidney injury and then how many of them recovered from that. And so it was clear that with these early studies that something was toxic um, within um, the, were released from muscles. Nowadays, of course, we see this crush injury mainly in earthquakes or in war zones. And you can see here on the left-hand side of the slide, the number of publications related to the number of earthquakes on rhabdomyolysis causing acute kidney injury. Um, worldwide, there are many venomous snakes which cause rhabdomyolysis and acute kidney injury. But I was very relieved when I came to the UAE to see that there were less than five reported viper bites in the last 20 years, so I think I'm safe. But of course, the armed forces um, do uh, get their troops to go through a lot of basic training, a lot of running, particularly in the heat. And you can see that there are a number of cases of um, rhabdomyolysis-induced acute kidney injury uh, from in, in the forces. And this seems to reach a peak during the hotter months. Of course, there were lots of causes of rhabdomyolysis. This is a patient of ours who used to inject drugs. And when he ran out of veins to inject in, he started to inject under his skin, so-called skin popping. And certainly when I was practicing in the UK and in Australia, uh, one of the common causes of rhabdomyolysis was injection of drugs. But there are multiple causes of muscle injury. But whatever the muscle injury, whether it's ischemic, stretch, drugs, exertion or trauma, we get the same sort of response from muscle cells and there are oxygen-free radicals produced. There's an influx of calcium into the myocytes and leukocyte infiltration. There's also an ischemic reperfusion injury. And that leads to edema within the muscle, uh, in the muscle bed, and cellular swelling, and often a compartment syndrome as well, which can make that injury worse and lead to further ischemia within the muscle itself. But when the muscle cell dies, it releases myoglobin and other metabolic components, creating kinase. There's phosphate released from inside the cells. You get a metabolic acidosis. 
you get an early hypocalcemia, hyperuricemia, and you often get big fluid shifts such that the intravascular volume is depleted. Obviously, if you get trauma, you may have blood loss as well. And this often leads to acute kidney injury, but can also lead to disseminated intravascular coagulation and the systemic inflammatory response syndrome. So the sort of biochemistry that we see typically in somebody arriving in the emergency department with rhabdomyolysis is hyperkalemia, and that can be quite severe, acidosis, hyperphosphatemia, hyperuricemia, an acute hypocalcemia and a late hypercalcemia, very high CK, which is the pathognomonic thing that we often look for, and urinary myoglobin. This scan you can see on the right was taken from a patient with um, a metabolic inflammatory myopathy, and you can see the uptake within the muscles in the leg and in the shoulder joints as well. So you can often visualize the muscles involved with a bone scan. This is one of my favorite ECGs taken from a patient who had very severe hyperkalemia who survived. And this is a so-called sine wave ECG you get with really severe hyperkalemia. Uh, this actually wasn't a, a patient with rhabdomyolysis, but I have seen potassium of this range in patients with rhabdomyolysis. Uh, but this patient had a, a heart-lung transplant and had missed some dialysis sessions and uh, came in with really very severe hyperkalemia. And when you see this ECG, that's the time to press the big red panic button and do something. But of course, myoglobin is very well known it's been toxic for a long time and Bywaters did other experiments where he infused myoglobin into rabbits and he neatly documented the acute kidney injury and found that it was much worse if the animals were dehydrated and much worse if they were acidemic and that was in 1944. So we've known that this is toxic for a very long period of time but the mechanisms have really not been that well known. And when I was at medical school, I was taught that because the myoglobin was deposited in the tubules, uh, it locked the kidney tubules and therefore you've got acute kidney injury. And we know certainly that myoglobin is deposited in the kidney and you can see that from this slide here where you can see a kidney from an experimental model of rhabdomyolysis in the rat and a kidney from a control animal. And you can see the brown pigmentation very clearly in the tubules there. Um, and we know now that the acute kidney injury is related to more the renal vasoconstriction and tubulotoxicity of the myoglobin rather than the tubular uh, obstruction. And although we see on urine microscopy these brown sugar casts of myoglobin and TAM horsefall protein in the urine, and if you do a biopsy, you can actually see these casts within the tubular cells, often surrounded by very tatty looking tubule uh, with ATN there. When you do micropuncture experiments, you can wash out these tubules pretty easily, suggesting that it's not tubular obstruction. They just happen to be there because of low urinary flow. But more important is the effect that uh, myoglobin has on renal vasoconstriction. We often see sympathetic activation by the nature of the injury in rhabdomyolysis but it's also not well known that myoglobin uh, is a very good sink for nitric oxide. Nitric oxide obviously is produced by the endothelium, and when we have um, myoglobin present within the lumen of the, any, any uh, blood vessel, it will act as a sink and, and, and suck up all of the nitric oxide, causing uh, vasoconstriction, particularly in the renal bed. Uh, in fact, um, myoglobin is actually well known for this within the muscle cells itself. But what I want to talk mainly about is the tubular cell toxicity, which is free radically mediated. And we know this because there's an induction of antioxidant enzymes, consumption of antioxidants, and some antioxidants partially protect. And originally, it was thought that this was related to free iron or Fenton chemistry. But now we know it's the myoglobin molecule itself. And again, I'll just remind you of the structure of myoglobin. It's the protein which holds this porphyrin ring by van der Waals forces within it. And that's responsible for the um, 
the whole molecule is responsible for the free radical damage. And when we look at the porphyrin ring, we can see that there's an enzyme which we normally have called heme oxygenase, which is responsible for breaking down that porphyrin ring and releasing free iron. So we now know that it's the molecule itself because if you uh, give a heme oxygenase knockout mice, rab mouse rhabdomolysis, you rapidly kill that animal from acute kidney injury. Um, and also if you upregulate heme oxygenase by giving it a stress beforehand, you can actually protect that animal against acute kidney injury. So we know now that um, myoglobin, when it's present within the muscle cell itself, is present in the Fe2 plus state. And this, um, this uh, state, it's a very stable molecule, uh, but when it's released into the circulation, it becomes into the three plus state, and occasionally it becomes in the ferrile form, the four plus state. Now, ferrile myoglobin is a very nasty free radical. It steals electrons pretty hard, and when it does that, the porphyrin ring actually cross-links to the globin chain, the myoglobin chain. And we can detect that spectrophotometrically, sorry, spectrophotometrically here by just adding a solvent like butanone. And so therefore, if you can show that there's been ferrile myoglobin present, you can show that there's been pretty nasty free radical injury. And we did that. And we looked at uh, patients and an animal model, and we showed that we could detect ferrum, the, the signature of ferrile myoglobin, of cross-linked myoglobin within the urine of uh, patients and an animal model with rhabdomyolysis. And you can't normally detect cross-linked myoglobin at all. We can also measure free radical damage in vivo by looking for things called isoprostanes. Now, isoprostanes and I'm sure you'll remember, they look very much like prostaglandins. But instead of being produced by an enzyme, these are produced by free radicals, and they can't really be produced by anything else. So if we can measure prostaglandins, we can show an elevated free radical injury. So we did that. We showed that um, in human urine, we had elevated free radicals by looking for isoprostanes compared with similar patients with renal impairment. But furthermore, we showed that alkalinization reduced this oxidant damage. And we could actually protect renal function by alkalinization. And we've known that alkalinization is probably good for patients with rhabdomyolysis for some time. But the mechanism for that wasn't really well understood until these experiments. So we looked and found that the rate constant for this, this uh, chemical decomposition of, of lipids was much, much higher at acid pHs and drops dramatically after a pH of 6.5. And that is the reason we want to like to keep urinary pH above 6.5 in patients with rhabdomyolysis because it dramatically reduces the amount of free radical damage. Furthermore, we went on to find some we looked at a number of chemicals that might help us uh, by preventing this redox cycling and the production of ferrile myoglobin, which causes a lot of damage. And we found that simple paracetamol will prevent this redox cycling. And simple paracetamol prevented renal failure and reduced isoprostane production or free radical damage in an animal model. So, do we have now any evidence to translate those animal models to the human situation? Well, we, we do in fact find that there are now beginning to show uh, some human experiments that have shown reduction in free radical damage in patients undergoing procedures that, that may cause rhabdomyolysis or, or, or hemolysis. Because I told you that myoglobin was a very similar molecule to hemoglobin and the same chemistry applies. And in this study, they used paracetamol before and after bypass and showed that was a reduction in free radical damage. It didn't equate to a reduction in acute kidney injury in this study, but this was a retrospective study showing that uh, in patients admitted with rhabdomyolysis, those that had taken paracetamol had a much lower chance of developing 
acute kidney injury. And so I think we're now at the stage where we can definitely start to, to um, give some guidelines on the use of paracetamol in um, uh, rhabdomyolysis. So a lot of the guidelines, these are my guidelines. Um, you're, you're welcome to uh, take them on or not. Uh, but they're modified from uh, national and international guidelines. And they use, there are a number of them available. And the reason I use this one is I uh, had the great fortune to walk, work with Keith Porter, who's one of the um, authors on this study. So at the scene, if you come across a crush injury, and, and obviously first responders do this, you need to, do, to get early and aggressive fluid resuscitation. It's estimated that if you survive a crush injury, um, then 40% of people will develop um, life-threatening hyperkalemia. So getting in uh, early and aggressive fluid resuscitation is really important. And saline is fine. If you've got bicarbonate, that's also great. Obviously, pain relief, no non-steroidals makes sense. But there's also a theoretical role for giving paracetamol at this, this point. In hospital, we obviously want to give normal saline and we want to give it fast and aggressively. And you can often give, um, you can often give a bolus of 8.4% sodium bicarbonate, but our aim is to keep the urine pH above 6.5. You can use isotonic bicarbonate in place of normal saline if you like, 1.26% bicarb, because you often run into problems of hypernatremia if you give too much of the, high, of the hypertonic uh, bicarb. But you want to aim to keep the urine output above 300 mils an hour, at least for the first 12 hours. And you'll need to check the electrolytes regularly. Uh, these patients run into electrolyte problems from both the disease and the treatment. Sodium, potassium, ionized calcium, magnesium, and bicarb, and importantly, urine pH. Only if the patient is diuretic should you consider uh, mannitol. Um, if there's no urine output, or if the patient's overloaded, you really have to stop and plan for some dialysis treatment. But I would add to this now uh, the addition of paracetamol every six hours because it probably doesn't do any harm and it may well do a lot of good. So what have I said in summary? Um, crush injury or any muscle injury leads to myoglobin release and myoglobin is deposited in the kidney. Myoglobin causes oxidant injury, and the ferrile myoglobin is really important in this regard. And if you can stop the redox cycling, and you can stop it going from Fe3 plus to Fe4 plus, then you do your patients a world of good. Tubular washout can be obtained by getting a diuresis, and the urine pH is really important to affect redox cycling and tubular damage. Paracetamol may well help your patient. Thank you very much for your attention. I think I've stopped the time. A review of the topic. If you can stay on the podium, since we have shortage of chairs. And may I ask the other speaker, please, to come and uh, sit next here? It's the floor is open for your question. Maybe I'll start, Steve. Uh, can, what is your explanation? How paracetamol can help in this situation? I didn't follow. What is how paracetamol can help patients with rhabdomyolysis? Paracetamol, paracetamol, yes. What? So, so um, paracetamol um, prevents redox cycling. It, it stops the um, ferrile form of myoglobin being produced, and it probably binds to one of the oxygen um, molecule pockets and allosterically hinders the uh, cross-linking and the, the, the ferrile myoglobin. It may act as an electron sump. Okay, great. This is a new for me. Yeah. 